Um, my name is Dustin Willis. I am a church planter in Columbia, South Carolina. The name of the church is Midtown Fellowship, and uh, I've been there for five years, launched three and a half years ago. Part of the collaborative team uh, with this event and uh, this collaboration together, and excited to do it. Um, the topic I've been assigned is um, what's your recipe for multiplying leaders slash disciples? Uh, we could argue that for a little bit if we wanted to, um, disciples or leaders. Um, I'm going to go with leaders, and, and, is, and then you can take it from there in your discussions for 45 minutes and rip it apart. Uh, if you've got a Bible, grab it. Um, hopefully you do. If not, you should quit your job. Uh, go to Exodus 18. That wasn't the blue. Uh, Exodus, Exodus 18 is where we're going to be for just a minute. Let's go there. Exodus 18. All right, we're going to, um, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with this passage. And when looking at leadership, uh, we're talking about Moses uh, and we're talking about his father in law coming into town to visit him and uh, comes to visit the family. Moses greets him, and very quickly as he greets him, Moses begins to share, um, like, in excitement, everything and all about that God is doing. So in the same way within your church plant or on your campus where you're at, somebody comes into town, they begin to ask questions. You quickly share the stories and share what God is doing, how exciting it is. And so let's pick up the story, verse 9. Let's read through it, and we'll discuss some things as we go. Hopefully this will prime our discussion. Verse 9. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel, and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. And now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses, father-in-law, before God. All right, so let's stop there for just a second. So, so here's kind of what's going on. Uh, Jethro, the father-in-law, comes into town. He's extremely pumped about all that God is doing in and among the people of God. Very excited about what's happening. I mean, God had rescued them. Um, he had taken them from the, the dominion of darkness, of slavery, rescued them out of that to freedom. Um, and what this leads to is they see this, and, and maybe you've had these moments, maybe for you it's been in a coffee shop or, or, or um, a bookstore, or where, wherever you're meeting with some other guys who have come into town, you're telling what you're doing. And it just led into this time of worship for them, this time of celebration and excitement for all that, um, that God had been doing. So, I mean, everything's going well. Um, everything's going well with the new up-and-coming church plan, if you will. It's all going good. And, and then you get to um, verse 13. It says, Then the next day Moses sat down to judge the people. And the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone? And all the people stand around you from morning till evening. Okay, so... You, you, you got to grasp the fact that I, I don't know what you, your father-in-law is like. Uh, my father-in-law is a retired colonel in the army, uh, and a graduate of the Citadel. If you know anything about South Carolina, the Citadel is a big deal there. He's a graduate of the Citadel, a retired colonel in the army, and uh, so me telling him what's going on in my life uh, it is fun and exciting, but the whole time I tell him that, I'm nervous. Uh, like the first time I ever met him, uh, I went to Ohio. They, they're from Ohio originally, and we went to a place, if you're familiar with it, it's right outside of Oxford, um, called uh, Houston Woods like State Park. Yeah, anybody? Okay, so I'm there, and we're staying in this little cabin. This is the first time I've met him. I just go up there and, and uh, got to meet him. And, and so I, then that morning, I uh, am asleep on the couch because that's if you're you know, trying to date the colonel's daughter, you get the couch. And so I'm on the couch and laying there asleep. And I don't know if you, I, I kind of woke up, and if you've ever felt a presence in the room like someone's looking at me. Uh, I, I woke up and I kind of just opened one eye because I was a little bit nervous. And I look and there's the colonel. And he's just sitting in a chair, all the lights are off, drinking his coffee, looking at me. <laughs> and, I'm, and I just like close my eye back real quick going, okay, all right. And if, if he comes over here, do I know what to do? Do I have a move? Can I, do I, can I become a ninja in this moment? Like I, it's just, and so he ends up 
20 minutes just sits there. I don't move because I'm never, I, didn't even, I haven't said hello to him yet because he got in way later than we did. I'd already been asleep and um, on, on the couch or whatever. And so the next day I go and talk to him and he's like, you always sleep with your mouth open, son? That was his first words to me ever. <laughs> And uh, so I did what all of us do as very conceited young men. I said, I saw you sitting there the whole time, which was not a great way to introduce yourself to your father-in-law, say, I saw you sitting there the whole time. Um, he always asks pointed questions, and then he sits quietly. Um, and, and I don't know if that's at all, and I'm not trying to make the direct comparison, but Jethro asked questions in this moment to his son-in-law that probably made his son-in-law cringe a little bit in this moment. Um, because he asked him this question, and then Moses tells him this. Look, it says, And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to inquire of God when they have a dispute, they come to me. And I decide between the one person and another and make them know the statutes of God and his law. And so Moses is like, well, this is why I do it. And so then what happens next? And this is, I think, going to help us prime a little bit what we're going to talk about. What happens next is huge. Um, I, I, I like to call it that Jethro drops a hammer on him, and he just drops a hammer, drops a bomb on him in this moment. That I think most of us, especially me, need to hear consistently. He says, now, now don't forget what happened before this. Remember all the good? Oh, we're celebrating all this. But, and it, but this is yet, even as things are going good. So your church plant, things are going good. You're multiplying. You're, all these things are going well. But, and so that's what Moses is kind of experiencing. But then Jethro says something that we maybe need to hear. What you are doing is not good. Wait a minute. We just had a worship service where it was all good. No, what you're doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out. For the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Um, I need to hear consistently, it's too heavy for you, Dustin. You can't do this alone. And so what is he telling to do? I mean, what do I probably need to hear today? He says, now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring uh, their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them known in the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe. And place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you. But any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you. And they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. And you will be able to endure. And all this people also will go to their places in peace. And so conclusively, kind of what he says is, he, he gives him basically about six points here. He says, represent God, warn people of the law, um, seek able men who fear God that can be trusted and have pure motives, empower them to do ministry, God will provide direction, and you will actually last in ministry, and it will benefit your people and the kingdom as a whole. And so he lays this out. And so, what does that look like for us where we are? What does it look like to multiply leaders? I think the first tension we have to sit with is this. Are we actually willing, especially in the context in which we lead, are we willing to hand things over to 19-year-olds? Are we? And we could do a study, and I'm sure that there are professors here who could do a much greater job at this than me, but there are arguments that the disciples, most of them probably were late uh, in their late teens. So what does it look like for us to hand it over to these disciples, to these 18, 19, 21-year-olds, if you will? What does it look like to empower them? Now, I know we all say, man, I need leaders. I've got to have leaders. Are we actually creating a culture that allows them to lead? where they have thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, as it's laid out. Are we willing to actually do that? Are, are you, as the guy who moved there, the man for the job, am I willing to relinquish power, willing to relinquish um, just responsibility? Now, yes, we'll let people stack chairs. 
We all know that. Anybody, you stack, stack some chairs. Yes, the stacks of seven. It's a perfect note. Yes, do that. Stack, yeah, stack the chairs. Are you willing to let a young guy get up in front of people and share gospel? Now, I'm not saying you need to, right, you're going to give him the stage every Sunday or you're going to give him the stage at all. Are you going to give him some type of stage? Can he lead three people? What does that look like to be able to do that? Um, and, and I'd like to propose this as a thought, just as you discuss here in the next minute or so. What does it look like for you to allow these leaders to lead and for you to empower them to lead in the context in what you already do? Because Jethro doesn't propose something different. Paul doesn't propose something different. You can look in 2 Timothy and you can look in Titus 2, where in Titus 2 it kind of talks about the structure and the leadership of the church. It happens within the church. And I think so many times what I've been guilty of is I go and go, well, I need leaders. i got to go create this leadership track that's different from what we do already in our church with our small groups, with our family groups, with our missions, whatever it may be. So what does it actually look like for us to set it up in such a way to where we produce and multiply these leaders by empowering them within the context of what we're already doing? Not that it becomes this separate idea, this separate thing. For the first couple of years that we started, I'll say this, that's what I tried to do. It was just more weight because I'm leading this other thing at the coffee shop at this day. But what is it like to put them and put your leaders with the thousands, with the hundreds, with the fifties, with the tens, as Jethro talks about, and as Paul talks about in Titus 2, within the younger, the, you know, the older with the younger, and just he sets up this framework. So what does it look like for us to be able to do that? To set that up in the confines of what we already do and not this separate thing that only taxes us and weighs us down more. But I think the primary question we have to get back to is, are we willing to actually relinquish power? I think we say it, but at a heart level, are we so prideful that we won't give up something where there might actually be a 19-year-old who's better at it than you? and me. All right? Let me pray for our time, and let's get going. Lord, thank you um, for the privilege it is uh, to look at your word, and then we don't have to go to other sources or anything else, but you bring out these ideas in your scripture. God, I pray through um, just this scripture that you would bring to light what it is that we need to hear, what it looks like for us to relinquish. God, if we need to even confess sin this morning of pride and not being willing to give things up um, Lord, would you, would you make that clear to us? God, show us what it looks like to do this within the church that we're in. Um, and God, I pray as we discuss through these questions um, that it bring out our own fears and bring out the conflict that we have in our hearts towards other young men leading. And God, as you tell us in your word, I, I just pray that we didn't trust reliable men who will also be qualified to teach. So help us with that. Direct us. Thanks for these men in this room. Um, God, help us with our time. Um, and I pray at the end of all this that the cross of your son Jesus will be at the center of every discussion. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.